Greetings, FFC family and friends. It is good to be with you today as we share God's word. We're going to continue in our series, our Bible study series, uh, Averting the Panic of a Pandemic, uh, Applying God's Promises to Your Prayers. Uh, we want to go on to our second week of this lesson series um, with the subject, Mediating Through Mess. Mediating Through Mess. And if you can get your Bibles ready, we're going to be coming out of Psalm 106 verses 28 through 31. And so again, our lesson for today is mediating through mess. And our text will be Psalm 106, 28 through 31. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time in your word. And we pray that you would bless it. Let it be a, a blessing to our very souls. We pray that you would continue to watch over us, keep us, give us the ability to persevere through all the things that are going on with this pandemic that we're experiencing right now. And then, God, we will thank you, not just on the other side, but as we're going through, because you are so worthy and you are so able. And so we thank you and pray that you would bless us in this time once again. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we discussed in week one, the series overview is that averting panic in a pandemic, it requires us to apply God's promises to our prayers. This is done especially with specific texts from the word of God that address what God's people needed to do during times of plague and pestilence. So we're taking text that deals with what the people of God experienced in the Bible and how they were able to overcome the plagues and pestilence that they experienced. So over the next few weeks, we will discover and review these key passages as we apply them to our praying. And so for the opening activity today, um, I want you to, to think about a question. The question is, what is the cause of corruption? What is the cause of corruption? So just based on your knowledge of what you think corruption is, just jot it down for a second. What do you, what do you think is the cause of corruption? You may say the root of corruption, but what do you or what would you ascribe to be the cause of corruption? And to take this definition even further as you're thinking, think about this next question. Which of the following is the typical root of corruption? And so I've given you five items, money, lust, dishonesty, pride, and or idolatry. You may say one, you may say a few, you may say all of them, but which one do you think is a typical root based on your definition, how you define the cause of corruption? Um, what would you say would be the typical root of corruption? And then the, the third question is what is the consequence of corruption? So we started with trying to think about the cause of corruption, but also looking at what is the root of it, but then what is the result of it? What is the consequence of corruption? So we know that when something is corrupted, something happens, something occurs. And so what is that consequence? I want you to think about that. It's going to help us guide what we're going to talk about today because we have to understand that when we want to mediate through mess, we have to understand that the mess is caused by something that has been corrupted. And last week, we discussed the impact of rebellion and how we as God's people can rebound from the results of rebellious actions by others. So, you know, last week was about others doing to us, but this week is about what, what can be inflicted upon us in terms of what can be infiltrated on the inside that corrupts our very essence, our very beings, and how we need to guard ourselves against that occurring in the first place. So today, we will start with the consequences of corruption. You talked about the cause, you looked at the root, and you had some thoughts about the consequences, but let's let's look at the consequences of corruption. Um, and then we'll continue with the concerted effort that is required to remain consecrated. Because again, if we're not corrupted, we're trying to be consecrated. But let's just start with part one, consequences of corruption. So we'll define corruption as uh, inducement to wrong by improper or unlawful means. It's a departure from the original or from what is pure or correct. And so just to get our mindset to, to have a framework for how we'll, how we'll get into this discussion during Bible study, we want, we want to define it. We want, we want to see it as something that, uh, is an, that is an inducement to wrong by improper or unlawful means. So people are not corrupted by doing the right thing. Um, and it's a departure from the original or from what is pure or correct. So if you're not consecrated, then you're corrupted. And, and, and the goal to being consecrated is to guard yourself against being corrupted. And so understanding what corruption is and going back to this passage we're going to go to today from Psalm 106, we'll see that with corruption, you will always have the corrupter 
and the corrupted. So with corruption, you will always have the corrupter and the corrupted. See, in corruption, it takes two. It takes two. Two to tangle. Two to make two to make that corruption occur. We don't we don't get corrupt in isolation. It takes some it takes someone that has the intent to corrupt to get someone else to corrupt. And so when you look at corruption, you look at again a corrupter and you look at the corrupted. And so in Psalm 106, verse 28, it says, They, with being the people of the children of Israel, joined themselves also to Baal Pure and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. So it says they joined themselves and then they went engaged in eating sacrifices offered to the dead. So corruption can infiltrate any area of our lives if we fail to keep a handle on our associations. That, that's something I want us to really think about for a moment. You know, your associations will either help you to be your best or they'll help you to do your worst. And so those we associate with have the ability to not only influence, but infiltrate how we view ourselves, how we view others, and how we view objectively. In other words, you know, we all have our own opinions, so there's that subjective nature, but objectively is the truth or a lie. So those that we associate with have the ability to not only influence, but also infiltrate those areas of our lives. So let's talk about the three areas of association, because we must know how we associate with other people. You, you know them. The first is blood. Blood, those you relate to by family. The second is bond, those you relate to by and through your friendships. And so these friendships you have with people, you develop a bond and, and those people become your circle of influence. And then the third area of association is belief, those you relate to by fellowship. And so we fellowship, we congregate, whether it be church, whether it be clubs, social clubs, um, whatever type of organization, we, 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 we get with like-minded people because we believe in something. And so we, we form these fellowships that have, again, the ability to influence our thinking and our being. And so a detailed account of verse 28 in Psalm 106 is found in a parallel passage, Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. And you'll see that those are listed as uh, subtext or, you know, additional text to support our, our text for today. But it says, while Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot and with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. And so in this passage, we see that Israel became corrupted when they did four things. First of all, they accepted an invitation to idolatry. They accepted an invitation to idolatry. Um, again, just because people invite you to something that may or may not be for your good doesn't mean you have to go with it. There, there's this thing that we have in, through the Holy Spirit that kind of gets us aware that maybe I shouldn't go to that place. Maybe I shouldn't go to that event. Maybe I should not associate myself with something that could um, not only jeopardize, but, but compromise my identity as a believer in Christ or as one of God's children. But the other thing, they became corrupted when they ate the sacrifices for idolatry. And so we have to understand that, you know, in going, accepting the invitation, they went in and they ate sacrifices that were intended for a false god. And then the third thing is, um, in this passage, Israel became corrupted when they attributed worship in their practice of idolatry. And so as you see this progression or this descent in their, in their uh, being corrupted, you can see how, you know, simple invitation could lead to something, you know, you know, eating something like, well, I don't know where this came from, but, you know, it looks good. But then you get into this whole thing where it's like, okay, well, you know, now I'm going to, you know, bow down to this God because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. Whatever this is, it's got me. And how do we know that? Because the last thing that showed that they became corrupted is that they adjoined themselves with idolaters. And so the, the, the thing about this passage that brought on the wrath of God is that this is not the first time Israel has fallen to idolatry. But it is it is that noticeable difference in the fact that they made an image, but now they're actually doing things. You know, they made the 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 uh, calf, the golden calf. But but this one now is that they're actually participating. They're practicing. So they're they're not 
um, putting together an idol, they're actually practicing idolatry um, through engaging with those that are not of God. And so the danger of idolatry is that one can get caught up and carried away without realizing the error of their way. For believers, we must guard our worship to be sure that we have accepted Christ as our Savior. We must make sure we eat or we ate from the table of remembrance of Christ as often as we can do it. And then we attribute glory, honor, and praise to God by adjoining ourselves with those who are like-minded in Christ and grounded in the Holy Spirit. So that, that's how we you know, avoid that, that error in our ways. But we have to understand the next thing, that consequences are granted, not given. Consequences are granted, not given. And we're going to see this in Psalm 106, verse 29. It says, thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. So as we kind of discussed last week, we have to understand that God is a God who does all things well, but God does not get in the business of being... Um, one that does things on the spur. He's one that allows us to understand what his will is, what his word says, and then gives us the ability to understand the consequences. And so this consequence that the plague broke out was a direct result of what was already indicated that would occur if Israel backed out of their covenant relationship with God. And so to take that even farther, let's look at the definition of consequence. It's a result or effect of an action or condition. It is the result or effect of an action or condition. And so we must look at it from the perspective that when we have a consequence, it's because we've already been told that it would occur if we were to do something that was outside of what, we're, what we were told not to do. And so we must always remember that the ways of God are for us to be pious, holy, not petty, haughty. OK, so God is just in all his ways. So it should be no surprise when his judgment comes in swiftly. If you read all the Old Testament, when God established his covenant, when God established the relationship with the people of Israel, he always said, as long as you obey me, as long as you do what I have commanded and asked of you um, or required of you, then you will be blessed. But the moment that you break away from this covenant relationship, the things that I have been protecting you from will come to pass. And so when the people of God refuse to separate themselves from the things of this world, then God will show his people what life separated from him is like. And, and, and as believers, we should, we should never want to know what that feels like because God does so much for us, things that we are aware of and things that we're not aware of. But let's get back to consequences. Consequences often occur when people fail to appreciate three things that God provides on a daily basis. First of all, God's provision. God's provision. It's what his grace allows. It's what his grace allows. It, it, all those opportune moments in life that we have from God is because of his grace. It is a beautiful thing. It's a blessed thing to have the provision of God in our lives. And we ought never to take it for granted because if it had not been for God, where and where will we be and what will we have in our lives? And so, so there's a consequence when people fail to realize, secondly, God's protection what his power assails. See, the thing is, God's power is able to overwhelm, overcome the uh, the attacks of the enemy. And, and that's why we need God to protect us each and every day. There's a song that says, Jesus, be a fence all around me every day. I, I need you to protect me as I travel along the way. And so if you know God can and God will, appreciate that protection that he provides in your life. The third thing is that consequences often occur when people fail to appreciate God's providence, God's providence. That, that is God's will for your life. That is the way that God has prepared a plan for you. And how does he prepare that plan? It's, it's because of what his mercy allots. The thing is, his mercy overflows. It endures throughout all generations because God gives us new mor a new morning full of new mercies. Every morning, every morning that we see is a new day and it has new mercies, which means that God has things in store for us if we believe that he is able to give us new newness of life each and every day. And so an absence of God's provision, protection, and providence will lead to a plague experience. So understand this, an absence of God's provision, protection, and providence will lead to a plague experience. It could be the consequence of disease, desolation, or even destruction. 
If you read the word of God, you will see that God is often more concerned about correction than consequence. Yes, God is uh, God is concerned about us getting on the right path, correcting our path. Yes, the consequences are there to warn us what will happen if we get off track. But God is always about keeping us on the right path. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it said that, you know, God even sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but that through him, the world might be saved. John uh, chapter three. So you got to understand that, you know, God is about us being corrected. But many people see God as a God of consequence because they don't realize that in his word, he's trying to get us on the right path. And so understand this. Consequences are granted, not given, because the consequence of corruption is clearly outlined in the covenant relationships God established with his people and in his word. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 25 through 26, God gave a clear account of the consequence of being corrupted through idolatry. And so he told Israel in this passage, Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 26, he said, when you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live on it, but will be utterly destroyed. And so this was not just a, a moment a moment in time. This was a, a, a generational thing that the importance of the current generation teaching the future generation that we have to uphold the holiness of God. We have to uphold our obedience and allegiance to God because all it takes is a breakdown in one generation to derail future generations. Now, it doesn't mean that God's mercy and his grace cannot bring us back. That's why he sent Jesus. But it's the key to us as believers, giving our children not just a monetary heritage, but a spiritual heritage that they can continue on in the faith. This passage is a clear indication that God took the deliverance he offered his people seriously. Just as old school upbringing put the fear of God in, in most of us that experienced it, we must have that same reverence for the consequences that will occur from God. You know that your parents, back in the old school, old school disciplining, told you what would happen if you don't stop or if you don't act right. And, and you know, it took those times where we didn't believe them that they would come through for them to come through and show us that they really meant what they were talking about. And so it's one of those things that, again, we have to understand that God wants us to live out this covenant relationship through his word that we have through Jesus Christ. Know that for every correction, there is a consequence, and for every consequence, there is a correction. I'll say that again. Know that for every correction, there is a consequence, and for every consequence, there is a correction. And so we see in Numbers uh, chapter 25, verses 4 through 5, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Pure. So we have to understand that, you know, as, as, as dreary as this, this passage sounds, God was trying to give a, get a point across is that if the leaders don't take the initiative to correct, the, to correct what was going on because of the consequences that needed to occur, then who was going to do it? The thing is, people that corrupt other people are not always those that are followers. It's usually those that are leaders. And that's as leaders, we must always guard our hearts so that we don't become corrupted. Because if a leader gets corrupted, you can guarantee that those that are following that leader will also be corrupted. Notice that God made an example out of those who were supposed to be an example. You see, we're not just supposed to be exceptional. We're supposed to be an example. But many times people want leaders to be exceptional and not and overlook leaders being an example. It is a clear reminder to us that we cannot afford to get caught up in the workings of idolatry. We must understand that the consequences of this type of corruption are very real. Which carries more consequences? I want to ask you this question. Correction from confession or corruption and why? So again, which carries more consequences? Correction from confession or corruption and why? Think about it. There's consequences that can occur when we confess our sins. Not always bad. 
when we confess our sins, there there are some some benefits to doing that because we're coming clean to God, who already knows what we've done, but we're being uh, open with him and we're agreeing with him that we've fallen short of a standard that he has given us. But correction is one of those things that we have to understand that it comes through confession, but it is more punitive when it comes through or comes after corruption. I guess I'm trying to make this clear is that we have to understand that the consequences that come from corruption, the correction is more severe. It, it is as you're coming up with your own understanding of this. I'm just trying to give you a, a, a basis of how to approach this question. Think about it. It's better to get to, 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 to admit to what you've done instead of being found out or found in want or found guilty of doing something that you could you had the opportunity to um, to share or to confess. In other words, it's better to deal with the penalty or the or the consequences of being honest than the consequences of being deceitful. So that's a deep question, I know. But let's go on to part two. Part two is concentrating on the consecrated. So if you want to, you know, again, steer clear of that corrupted nature, you got to focus on or we have to focus on that consecrated nature that God wants us to uh, uh, um, to acquire. So here's another question. When was the last time you took a stand for something or someone you believed in? When was the last time you took a stand for something or someone you believed in? Think about that as you as you ponder on that. You don't have to write it down. Just, just bring it to your memory. And then think about this. Did your actions justify or jeopardize the outcome of your stance? So pick one. Did it justify or did it jeopardize the outcome of your stance? So, you know, did you have a result that allowed your actions to be justified or did your actions jeopardize what you thought you were trying to accomplish? Well, going on in our lesson today in Psalm 106, here's the next point under part two. Judgment stays when the just stand. So judgment stays. And this stays is more in the sense of halting or breaking when the just stand. And this is going to come from Psalm 106, verse 30. And it says, Then Phineas stood up and interposed, and so the plague was stayed. So then Phineas stood up and interposed, and so the plague was stayed understand that when we take a stand for God, when we are willing to intercede, mediate, uh, that's the interpose, it, it gives us the ability to, you know, access the power of God. Just like when Elijah prayed and, 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 and it stopped raining, and then when he prayed again, it rained again. These are things that come with having a zeal for God, a zeal for God that is so bold that you're, that you're willing to stand out amongst those that are sitting by. So to understand this zeal, we're going to define zealous. Zealous is, a, is full of a zeal that is ardent, active, devoted, and diligent. So zealous is being full of a zeal that is one ardent, active, devoted, and diligent. This is so, so apropos to us being believers that we need to have a zeal that is ardent, a, a zeal that is active, always, always engaged, devoted. We have that faithfulness in our hearts, a willingness to be faithful, and in that diligence that we don't wait, we, we act on it, right? So taking a stand can be a difficult feat. I don't want it to seem like being zealous is the easy thing. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of boldness. But especially if you are in the minority of standing for what is right, this can be true, that it can be a difficult feat. It can even be lonely, but when you think about God and who he is to you, what his presence means to you, why he is so great to you, it ought to make you stand for him. It, it's, 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 no, it's no question that if God is who he is to you, then seriously, you ought not just clap for him, you ought to stand for him. You ought not just wave for him, you ought to stand for him. You ought not just sing and dance for him, you ought to stand for him. You ought not just teach and preach for him, you ought to stand for him. And then you you not you don't just do or give to him, you stand for him because it is in standing for God that you do all these other things and people know that you're standing for the righteousness of God. This is what occurred 
when the corruption got out of control that it caused Phineas to rise up and shut down the foolishness that was on full display. I want to take you to Numbers chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. It says, Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Mennonite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. You see, when the consequences of corruption begin to lead others to correction, it should not be a surprise that there will be some who just don't get it. One of the worst things we can do in life is to live corrupt and think we are correct. So while the people of Israel were lamenting the consequences of their actions, the scripture tells that a son of Israel was trying to be covert in his corruption at, at the very tent of meeting, drawing near to the tent of meeting. Instead of coming near the tent of meeting for consecration, for confession, he was about to bring further desecration by bringing the Minneite woman to his family. He was trying to sneak her in. Instead of being separate from the other nations that surrounded Israel, he was being selfish, putting his needs over the needs of his own people. You got to understand when people are corrupting, there's always that selfish motive. It's, it's not for you to be better. It's not for you to... Uh, be wiser. It's, it's, it's for you to get duped because this person has a selfish motive in trying to corrupt or trying to, um, you know, continue the corruption that God is trying to, to weed out. So it is at this point that Phineas takes his stand and mediates. He knew how to mediate because clearly uh, he did some meditating on God's law. Israel was instructed not only to avoid idolatry, but also intermingling with the people outside the nation of Israel. So Phineas' example shows us how judgment will stay, it'll halt, it'll break when we as God's people are willing to take a stand. Sometimes we look for others to take a stand when we should be the one to do it. When we see wrong, we ought to seek right. No, There's no if and, if ands and buts about it. If we see, if and when we see wrong, we ought to seek right. Because when we do, Lives can be saved. Deliverance can come and set free people from the bondage of the corruptible sin that exists in this world. So how do we take a zealous stand for righteousness? Well, the first thing we have to do is assess it. Assess it. Assess the situation. Discern what you are dealing with. Many times when you when you have to take a stand, you got to make sure you're taking a stand for God's righteousness and not your own. Like it can't be that you, you, you're jealous, you're mad about something because you see something. You, you have to be doing it from the perspective that God is not pleased with what is going on. And so through the Holy Spirit, you're discerning um, this stand that you're about to take and the nature in which you're about to take it, which is the second thing of how we can take a zealous stand for righteousness. We must apprehend it. We must determine how we will deal with it. Now, in this case, this was a different time. You can't do, you know, if you do what he did, there may be some real consequences, but 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 it's one of those things where it's a, it was a confrontation. So how he confronted was based on what was allowed during that time, but according to the law of the of the nation. But but in this situation, in our situation present day, we have to apprehend it. We have to confront it. So sitting back and saying, "Well, somebody else will deal with it," is not the solution. If we see that God is is not pleased with something that is taking place or something is taking place that doesn't please God, then we have to determine how we will deal with it. The Bible gives us so many ways in the Gospels about how to take our brother or sister who is in sin to, to, and, and confront them. If that doesn't work, you go get those that are spiritually wise. If that doesn't work, then you take them in front of the whole congregation. There, there are always procedures in the Bible that tells us how to get people on the right track. If we see somebody that is, is stuck on sin, even in the letters of in the epistles, we learn that we are we are those that are stronger in our faith ought to help the weaker uh, brother or sister in Christ. So again, after you discern what needs to that something needs to happen, then you have to determine how you're going to deal with it. But then the third thing is 
You can't just assess it and apprehend it in your brain. You have to attack it. You have to deal with it. You have to you have to meet it head on, face on. You got you have to be able to say, you know what, we need to get this thing done because if if, if we're not willing to correct something that is corrupted, then what happens is it'll fester and it'll corrupt the whole body instead of being isolated to just one or two people. So when people ask you, because this is gonna happen when you assess, apprehend, and you go on the attack, they're gonna say, "What's your deal?" Well, just let them know what is going on is a big deal. Because when sin goes unchecked, it is a big deal. When lies go unchecked, it is a big deal. Don't say, well, he ain't talking about me. So she ain't talking about me. That's not my problem. No, it's a big deal when you have lies that are being perpetuated in the body of Christ, let alone the world and society we live in. It's a big deal when idolatry goes unchecked. And it's a big deal when misguidance goes unchecked. So if you know that a leader or person that's in a power position is doing something that is not right, not of God, it is our job as believers to be able to speak up based on the protocols that we have established in the word of God. So as we go forward, we're going to look at this definition of jealous. So jealous is can be defined as intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness, diligent in guarding a possession. So based on the above definition, under what circumstances is being jealous a good thing? So based on the above definition, under what circumstances is being jealous a good thing? Well, we're going to get into that in a minute. But the next point under this section is that God consecrates those who covet his righteousness. God consecrates those who covet his righteousness. And we're going to take this out of Psalm 106, verse 31. It says, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness to all generations forever. And it was reckoned to him for righteousness to all generations forever. We should always seek to honor the just of God by being jealous when it comes to upholding his holiness and covenant. So the justice of God is worth us being jealous about when it comes to upholding his holiness and covenant. If you think about that definition, think about where we're about to go. Phineas was considered blessed of God because he took the holiness of God seriously and not suspiciously. It is a sad testament when the conviction of God's people becomes suspect because they don't trust in the holiness of God to bring them out on the side of God's righteousness. A detailed account as to how the zeal of Phineas was reckoned to him for righteousness is in Numbers chapter 25, verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him, a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. From this passage, we see that he was judicious while jealous. He was judicious while jealous. Anytime we take a stand for God because we are seeking to carry out the word and will of God, it is a sign of our reverence of and for him. When we think of the word jealous, we often think about people being haters, envious, covet coveters, greedy, or over the things of the world. But how many times do we see people get jealous for God? To be jealous for God is to covet his righteousness to the point that you won't let anybody or anything get between you and his righteousness. If you want to be jealous for God today, you got to covet his righteousness to the point that you won't let anybody or anything get between you and his righteousness. It is so strong that you are aware of the implications that come from a disregard of God's righteousness. It was because of Phineas being wrapped up in God's righteousness that God turned his wrath from the people. It's a blessing when you take a stand again, it stays the judgment of God because God sees that there are people. He said, my people that are called by my name, you know the text, we're going to talk about it in the upcoming weeks. If we take the stand, the initiative to do what he asks us to do, then he will hear 
and then he will heal. And so remember, when the people of God cease to worship him, there will be, there, then we will experience the wrath of God. And, and when that happens, those of us that are spiritually in tune must be willing to take that stand, to take that stand and call on God and uh, so that he can hear us from heaven and heal the land. In Numbers 25, 10 through 13, we see that coveting righteousness will bring us three things. First of all, peace with God. It, it is one of those things where it will bring you peace of mind, but it will bring peace to your soul when you seek after the righteousness of God, because it brings this cleansing that allows you not to get stained by being silent and not acting on what it is that God has put in our hearts to act on, which is to stand for his righteousness. But also it'll bring us perpetuity in God. In other words, we ought to want to see our relationship with God be long lasting because it will be everlasting when we get to heaven, but it ought to be long lasting. It ought to be some continuity. It ought to be this thing that we're not just in God some of the time, but we're walking with God all the time. And then the third thing that coveting righteousness will bring, it'll bring us purpose through God. In other words, my purpose is to be perfected by God. In other words, my purpose is to fulfill the will of God. My purpose is to do the will of God so that it's it's, it's no 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 secret that my my life's desire is to do what is pleasing to God. And that should that should be something that we all come to grips with or come to an understanding on our own terms with God, that if we want to have the things of God, if we want to have peace with God, perpetuity in God, purpose through God, then we have to seek his righteousness. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything that you desire will be added to you. In other words, that ought to be our life's testimony. It's not an individual thing. It's a collective thing as a body that we ought to strive for. But moving to part three, our final section for today's Bible study is understanding that we are conditioned by the covenant. So we talked about corruption. We talked about the consequences. We talked about all these things that come with it. Um, but let's get to this whole thing about, you know, how do we mediate through mess? Well, we're going to look at two conditions that the covenant, the promises of God gives to us to help us understand how we can, you know, keep ourselves, you know, stable, sane at peace during pandemics, during crisis, during any situation. Because the thing is, there's always something that 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 brings on the onset of things that impact not just certain individuals, but cities, countries, nations, the world. And it's usually the acts of individuals that are corrupt or selfish that become um, an epidemic for those that are innocent, for those that are not a part of the initial corrupting. And so, Understand this, our actions should always be conditioned by the covenant. As believers, the word of God is what conditions us. It, it molds us. It, it, it makes us into who God wants us to be. It is his promises that provides purpose, power, and protection from the things that would bring us down. So when you are conditioned by the covenant, you are being built up on a firm foundation. But in order to be conditioned by it, you have to consider and concentrate on the one who established that covenant, established those promises. That's why when these things happen to the innocent and the guilty, those that are righteous in God ought to be able to, to reflect, open up our eyes to see what is really going on, what is really needed to bring us through these things that we are experiencing. And so the first condition is this, watch out for the spiritual counterfeits of opinions and objects. Watch out for the spiritual counterfeits of opinions and objects. What happens when people lose track of the truth, when they stop focusing on the truth and start listening to lies? And lies aren't always obvious. There's some people who are really good. Matter of fact, our, our adversary, the devil, is called the father of lies because he, he has a smooth tongue. He, he, can, he can be able to convince you that something sounds good, but it really isn't good. And that's the same thing when people try to come and give you this counterfeit spirituality where they give you these phrases or give you these catch things or omit certain things that are, that are in the word, but they don't want you to hear it because they don't want to offend you and turn you off from the word. But, but the other thing is objects, those things that people put in place to get it to be the object of our attention. We have to watch out for those things. Because if we're of the co of the covenant, we're being conditioned to please God, not to go against God. 
And so look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. It says, So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. And verse 24 is key. It says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And so this passage is saying, watch it. Don't forget, first of all, what God told you. Don't forget the truth of God. Don't forget that he made us to be his people. And we and 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 and, and we 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 ought not make up any type of graven image um, or anything that is against the Lord because he has commanded us not to worship idols, not to worship graven images. And so many things that we we, we see in the law of Moses. But also in the word in, in its in its totality, that we, we cannot substitute truth for lies, truth for opinion, because opinion is always subjective, it is not objective. So there is no substitute, you know this, there is no substitute for God's promise or stand in for God's presence. I'll say that again. There is no substitute for God's promises or stand ins for God's presence. We must watch ourselves. Because God does not play when it comes to the holiness of his promises and presence. Saying, I didn't know, is unacceptable when you do know. So the second condition is this. We will always find compassion in God's correction. We will always find compassion in God's correction. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, it says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with your heart and all your soul, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. So this is interesting. This is interesting because when you when you read this passage, it makes so much sense that in the time of trouble, in the time of distress, that is the time to call on God. That is the time to seek God. Because when we're going through a period of correction or going through a period of circumstance, going through a period of distress, going through a period of crisis, we can always find compassion in God's ability to correct the situation. Not just individuals, correct the situation. And how do we find it? Well, this text tells us how we can find it. First of all, we have to seek him. You got to seek the Lord, as the scripture says, while he may be found. But if you seek him, you will find him. If you knock, the door will be open. And then that process begins or continues because as you seek him, you have to search for him. See, seeking him is the mindset, but searching is the actual doing. It's the action of doing it. You know, it's one thing if you think about seeking God in your mind, but it's about searching for him. It's doing the things that get that will get you closer to him. Um, next, how would you find him? Return to him. When you realize where God is and where you are, if you're not up, if you're not near God, if you're not tight with God, that seeking and searching will get you or cause you to return to him. Sometimes we don't even know that we're separated from God because that's how corruption takes a hold. You don't know that you're being corrupted because the person who's corrupting you is being so smooth that you think, hey, everything's okay until things get terrible. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? And so after you return to God, listen to him, figure out how did I get wrong and how can I stay right with God? Listen to his word, realize that, oh, this is why this happened. Oh, this is how I got off track because the word is telling me how to get back on track. So remember what God promised. It'll help us to mediate through the messiness that rises from the corrupt nature of mankind. When people are so corrupt that they lie and deceive to get others to believe in things that are not of God, it should stir up something in us to stand for truth. Because standing for the righteousness of God requires us to meditate on his word. The more we meditate, the more equipped we will be to mediate. So I want to leave you with that point. The more we meditate, the more equipped we will be to mediate. I guarantee if you want to be able to get through You got to meditate so that you can mediate, not just for yourself, but for those that are falling prey to corruption. I will leave you with this verse and then we'll pray. When we are willing to do this, we'll be like the person described in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 2. 
How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Let us pray. God, thank you again for giving us opportunity to be in your word. We just pray that you would continue to give us that boldness to stand in your holiness, to stand for your holiness, and to seek your holiness, Lord. Continue to bless those that are seeking to grow in their knowledge of you through these Bible studies and help us to continue to, to ask so that we may receive of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be blessed, and we'll see you Sunday for the online message.